Well, Psalm 47 says, clap your hands, all peoples. Shout to God with loud songs of joy. For the Lord, the Most High, is to be feared. He is a great king over all of the earth. He's a great king over all the earth. In that psalm, and in many verses scattered throughout the rest of the scriptures, is a foundational claim to Christianity. That God is not just creator. He didn't just breathe everything into existence, but he's also king. He's all powerful. He rules over reality. He's the theological word. He's sovereign. He's, he's in control. He, he, God doesn't show up on Monday mornings with a cup of coffee in his hand and reports to a boss. And some of you startup guys are like, me neither. <laughs> but when I say God reigns, I don't mean he's like a tyrannical, like stagnant king. Rather, he uses his power to provide ways for us to know him and to purpose history towards a day. And it's a day that we've been talking about the past couple of weeks when Christ will return, when God will wipe away all evil and when God will dwell with his people. He is purposing history. He's using all of his power to purpose history towards a day when he'll be ultimately gladified and we'll find the satisfaction we've been looking for all of our lives. It'll be almost like history is moving towards a wedding day. And so when, and so when if God is purposing history towards that moment, it'll feel like the end of history. But as C.S. Lewis says, it'll quite literally be like all of history was just the introduction in the title page. And then we'll begin the greatest story ever told. God is purposing history towards a day where he'll dwell with his people. Uh, I like it. John Piper says, a lot of people tend to call that idea the sovereignty of God. He says, I prefer to use the word providence because sovereignty just says he's, in, he's all powerful. Providence says he's using his power for love and purpose to bring us to that day of his glory and our good. Now, why do I mention that? You're like, you usually start with a story. Where is it? Because it's it's so serious that you just need to understand that reality. That uh, if, if, if we're gonna have the power to pull off what Paul's telling us, then we have to have this great perspective of God and his providence. That Paul here is going to give us the will of God for your life. Like, straight up. Like, what is God's plan for your life? What is God's desire for your life? What is God's will for your life? What does he want you to do with your life? And he just gives it to us straight up. And I mentioned, I mentioned that about a big view of God. Because if you don't have that big of a view of God, you won't be able to do the things he's talking about. You won't be able to do them. It's like if, if you're a tailgater or you're a camper, what do you need for power? You need a generator. And then you plug all of your, your grills, your TVs, everything up to that. What do you need to do the will of God? You need a great view of God that in his providence, he is making ways for you to know him. And in his providence, he's purposing history towards a day. And so you plug up these things that Paul's going to give us to that. And so what are the three things? He says, rejoice, pray, and give thanks. Which you're like, ooh, I can, I can do that in 24 hours. <laughs> Not the will of God, check. But then you look at the words that modify it. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, and all of a sudden, this this task looks impossible. It's like summer reading. No way, Jose. (laughs) It's only impossible if if you're not plugged up to the source. It's only possible that you'll pull off the will of God. What really matters here, yes, yes, these commands are great, but they're only great as much as you plug them up to the power source. And so let's look at them. The first one, he says, rejoice always. There should be an ongoing cheerfulness, a gladness, a happiness, a delightfulness that radiates both in and from your life. Like, how do you know you're following the will of God? You're rejoicing. How do you know you're being obedient? This may be new to you. You're rejoicing. That, uh, it, it's interesting. He doesn't say simply possess joy. What he says is express joy, rejoice, 
Uh, someone should be able to scan your workplace, scan your family, scan your friend group, and you should stand out. Like, your joy should stand out. It, actually, if that happened, if I, if I or someone else did that, watched you for a day, would you stand out in whatever area of life you're in? Would your joy stand out? Paul is advocating that it should be evident in a culture where it's really not prevalent. Because I don't think I have to convince you that uh, there, it's not a very happy culture. All I have to do is tell you to go to the Google review section of any restaurant. <laughs> because for every five-star rating, there is a Harvard-level review that will destroy a croissant. <laughs> A study that's been measuring happiness and joy since 1976 says for the first time in the past few years are when the lines have crossed. Now it is way more prevalent to say I'm not joyful and I'm not happy than to say I am. And so Paul's saying rejoice because you'll stand out. Your joy should be prevalent where it's not that evident. And I I remember when I was young and, and didn't understand the gospel, I would look around and and I'd be like, okay, well, the Christians aren't off the hook. These, are the, these suckers aren't more fun than I am. If, if, they have, if, if they have the happy news of the soul, why aren't they happy? And then, and then I, would, I would question it in my mind and, and I would hear the answer. I would hear the same sermon. I, if you grew up in church, you know what I'm, you heard the happiness versus joy sermon. Anybody? Happiness is a feeling, it's fleeting, it's temporary, it's worldly, it's of the devil. Joy is a choice, it's everlasting, it's heavenly, it's godly. And then the sermon would end with some crescendo of, God did not call you to be happy, he called you to be holy. And I'd be like, whoa. Don't know if I want that. But it's interesting, I found comfort in, the Bible does not make that dichotomy. It doesn't divorce the two. Rather, the two are interchangeable. And so the problem is not the words, because there's such thing as temporary joys and eternal happiness. There's eternal joy and temporary happiness. So what's the difference? I, I, I'm afraid that in divorcing the two and making Christianity all, of, all about joy and we don't want anything to do with happiness is that we've stolen the emotion and we've stolen the expression out of joy. And we've settled for a version of Christianity where if Jesus Christ has died to save us and bring us to life, we just walk through life with our hands in our pockets. But he's called us to be expressive, to be radiant, but not superficial. He's not calling you to be, I'm blessed all the time. I'm blessed. Ooh. Why are you blessed? I don't know. I'm just blessed. That's superficial. It's surface level. People see right through that. Our joy is to be expressive because it's informed. Uh, Luke 2 literally answers and says that, and starting in verse 10, when the angel comes to Mary, it says, I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people, for unto you is born this day a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Joy is the result of information. It's the result of good news. Where do we get the word gospel from? That word right there, good news. Joy is the result of the gospel. What's the gospel? That a savior has been born. A savior, Jesus Christ came to gain power? No. To defeat a government? No. To gain you and defeat death. Grace came and it produces joy. It's interesting, the word grace is charis. And the, word jo- and the word joy is kara. The word joy literally comes from the word grace. What is the product of good news, of grace coming into your life? Joy. Do you know what that means? Do you, do you understand what that means for you? That means if you have no view of grace, if you have no view of, of, of a godly grace, then you won't have joy. Do you realize what that means? That means if you have a small view of grace, if Jesus, if Jesus just came into your life to turn you from a bad person to a good person, then you have a little bit of joy. But if you have a, if you have a godly view of grace, that you were dead, that you were blind, that you were lost, and grace came and rescued you, you will have a great joy. It's interesting, the word right there isn't just joy, it's mega joy. 
The gospel produces mega joy, a joy that will rejoice always. And it's quite literally not even of this world. It's from another world. Our joy is from God. That's what Paul says earlier in this letter in chapter one, verse six. He says, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit. The source of joy is not their efforts to keep a joyful outlook. The source of joy was quite literally God. It was God's joy. Question, how do you get an apple? Grocery store, I heard it. Where does the grocery store get the apple from? An apple tree. Where do you get joy from? You go to its source, God. That's why Galatians 5.22 says, a fruit of the spirit is what? Joy. It, it, is, it is the product of God. It's almost as if before God was creator, he existed in a trinity. And so before God was known as creator, he was a father, a son, and a spirit, existing in communion with one another, enjoying each other's presence, delighting in one another, showing honor and glory and love to one another. It's almost as if before God created, he in himself was joy. And it was out of that joy that he created the world. And it was out of that joy that he created you. And so it's almost as if you were made for that kind of joy. Augustine said this, you yourself, speaking of God, are joy. The happy life is this, to rejoice to you, in you, and for you. That's it. There is no other. Our joy is untouchable. We can rejoice always because its source is unmatched. If our joy has come from another world, then nothing in this world can touch it. Some people say that there's parts of the oceans that are so deep that not even the, not even the craziest of storms can touch it. What if there was a joy that was so great that not, not even the worst of storms in your life could touch it, that you would rejoice always? And, uh, but what, what made it really distinct, what made, the, what made the rejoicing of the Christian really distinct is that it extends into all situations. That's where uh, we see that it rejoices always. That uh, it, it's interesting, that word rejoice wasn't even used by other writers outside of the scriptures, that joy was very distinct to Christianity. I remember, this, this began to make sense to me, whenever I was a freshman in college, and if you know me, you know I have a resting, smiling face. <laughs> like everywhere I go, I, I accidentally, it's not because I'm holy, I accidentally smile. I'll see you in the hallway and I'm like, ah. And as an introvert, it invites way too many, it invites way too many conversations. I'll see someone in the bathroom and I'm smiling. I'm like, no, I didn't, uh-uh, I promise I'm just going to the bathroom. But uh, it's, a, it's a problem, I smile too much, I have to work on frowning. But uh, I showed up freshman year and I joined some men's organization and you know, there was like two upperclassmen guys and. I guess they didn't like that I smiled. And uh, one day, it was like finals week, and you know, there's not much to like be happy about. And they said, Thomas, why you smile so much, bro? I'm like, Sar sorry. <laughs> and, uh, and then I come in the next day, like really preparing my frown. And they're like, Thomas, are you smiling? I'm like, no, 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 I promise, promise. Actually, before this, I was kicking rocks. And before that, I, I dug a hole to bury myself in it. <laughs> and then two years later, the same thing happened. Not the same guys. I, I was spreading mulch, which is not something to be excited about or joyful or happy about. But I, I, I guess I looked happy spreading mulch. And this dude I was working with was like, dude, what the heck? Why are you smiling? And it was then. It was then that it made sense to me. You don't have a worldview where joy can extend into hardship. You, you don't have a worldview where joy can exist when things are hard. You, you don't have a worldview of a joy that's almost not of this world. You don't have a worldview of joy that has come from grace. And uh, I, I do wanna say, being rejoicing always does not negate grieving. That a, a way to, helpful, to like helpfully remember this is the, two, the shortest verse in the English Bible is what? Jesus wept. The shortest verse in the Greek New Testament is this. Scripture holds both. It says you can grieve and you can rejoice. 
Just know, just have the confidence, just have the hope that all of your grieving can end in joy because where God is purposing history is towards a day when all tears will be wiped and joy will stand. And so the joy extends into all situations. And, and when, you, when you don't know how to rejoice, when you don't know what to do, if, if that's the will of God, that I'm trying to rejoice always, ah, it leads you to something. It leads you to want to talk with somebody. It leads you to want to pray without ceasing. So that's the second one, pray without ceasing. Now, prayer, I like to think of it, is in three pillars. First, it acknowledges our dependence. It says, okay, God has power, God has love, God has forgiveness, God has joy. I don't have those things. I'm a very finite creature. I hit the snooze button eight times. I need him in my life. It, it acknowledges our dependence, but it also assumes he's present. That there's not, a place, there's not a place I can go where God isn't there. There's not a time that I can move to that God isn't there. That, that he's absolutely present and he, he's absolutely working in every situation. On Friday night, in the car on the way to work, he, he's present. I remember my model for prayer used to be this bracelet I wear. And, and I'm really sorry if you're wearing one. And, and I don't mean it any harm, but it said WWJD on it. And I know we all used to wear that thing. And uh, it used to be my model for prayer because I would be like, and I didn't really know the gospel and I didn't really know how to pray. I'd be like, okay, Jesus, what would you do? Would you cheat on this test? Well, you, did, you said I shouldn't lie, so I, I guess you wouldn't do that. And then I would try to go with, to him with something more personal. I'm like, okay, Jesus, what would you do? I like this girl. Should I text her or should I call her? And then I, re I realized I was just treating this man like a man of history that lived in a grave. I wasn't treating him as the risen Christ who is provident, who is present in every moment. I was, to fail to pray is not to fail to do some religious rule. To fail to pray is a failure to see that God is God. To fail to pray is to be blind to the reality of God. That means to pray is quite literally, as Ephesians 1 says, to have the eyes of your heart enlightened, to realize that, that God is all powerful and God is all present in every moment. To pray is to accept that we're dependent on God for everything. And so prayer isn't forcing God's hand, it's just acknowledging that God is God and I need you and I'm finite and I, and I don't have what it takes to change this situation or I don't have what it takes to understand what's going on inside me. So I approach you because you're God. Now, those are two pillars and if you were listening, I mentioned three. And those two weren't really the, the pillars that distinguished Christian prayer from other prayer. What really distinguished it, what really made it distinct was that when the disciples asked Jesus, how should we pray? It's how we started. He said, our father. What, what changed the game was that prayer approached God as father, as a father whose desire was to do good for his children. This took the classic cold stiffness of prayer and pumped life and warmth and relationship into it. That approaching God isn't this transactional, scratch my back and I'll scratch yours. Approaching God is like a, is like a daughter or a son and a father. He never hangs up the phone. There's, this is the great hope. There's one time, every time Jesus prays throughout the gospels, he calls him father. There's one time where he doesn't call him father. It's on the cross. He says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Don't you realize what's happening there? By Jesus feeling the abandonment of his father, it secures the promise that God the father will never leave you and will never forsake you. He'll never leave you on call waiting. This is the great hope that you approach God as a father and he never leaves you on call waiting. He's like me talking to my parents. They never hang up. I have to hang up. Uh, so always approach God because he's father. But without ceasing, that's a high command. You're like, what about picking up the kids? What about my job? What about studying? What about emails? What about my skincare routine? What about pickleball? What about drinking? What about breathing, Paul? Paul's not advocating that we shave our heads and become monks and use every breathing breath to pray. Because prayer in its essence is not a position of the body or it's not an arranged set of words. You say, what? Well, Jesus said quite literally to the Pharisees, he said, they draw near to me with their mouths and honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. 
What Paul's advocating when he says pray without ceasing is a, is a constant God consciousness, a constant attitude of dependence upon God. It's an attentiveness of the, not, of the mind and an attitude of the heart. It, to pray without ceasing is to not cease to set your mind and your heart on God. John Bunyan, who's my favorite writer, says in prayer, it is better to have a heart without words than words without a heart. One commentator wrote, it is not in the moving of the lips, but in the elevation of the heart to God that the essence of prayer exists. As you read Paul's letters, you find everything in the world prompts him to pray. He'll be writing a letter and he just breaks off and starts praying in the middle of it. He thinks of you, he starts praying. He thinks of God, he starts praying. He thinks of suffering, he starts praying. Everything in the world makes him think of prayer. Is that true of you? Are you going to a, moody, a, a, a meeting and, and you're thinking about God. You're thinking about that the people you're gonna interact with, that they're made in the image of God and broken because of sin and have a desire and a God-sized hole in their heart. D does, does that perspective dominate you? Your acts of prayer may be intermittent, but the spirit of prayer is, incess is incessant. Now, I remember when I first heard this taught, I, uh, I was like, whew, Pray without ceasing. You really justified that for me because I have not prayed in a long time, but I got that attitude. I got that, I got that consciousness, but I haven't actually been praying. And I don't mention all that to justify you not praying. You won't be able to pray without ceasing unless you're actually praying throughout moments, throughout days, throughout seasons of life. Think about it. If the one who is in control over reality cares for you, do you really want to go through a season of life without talking to them, without connecting with them? If you're about to get married, do you really want to go through that whole season without praying, without connecting? I, I was challenged by a question I heard the other day that said, if God were just to do a miracle right now and answer all of your prayers for the last 365 days, what about life would be different? And it struck me because I'm a little ashamed of my answer because the world wouldn't look very different because I haven't been going to a present provident father who, who desires the best for me. And so we pray without ceasing. And then I love, uh, Charles Spurgeon says, he says, when joy and prayer are married, they have a child. And they name the child gratitude. And that's the last one. What is the will of God for your life? It's to rejoice always. It's to pray without ceasing. It's to have a mind and a heart set on God in every circumstance, in every situation, in every moment. And then, it, and then it's to give thanks in all circumstances. Now, it's worth noting at this point that non-Christian culture still advocates for these three things. Rejoice, pray, give thanks. You're like, what? I'm like, go read any article. It'll tell you, Set your mind on happy thoughts, uh, meditate, and have a spirit of gratitude. Those aren't, those aren't foreign things. The, the things that Paul's are, Paul is mentioning doesn't exist just within the church. You, you can go do those things elsewhere, but their power, their power comes from what they're rooted in. Their power comes from a source. Think about it. Why do you rejoice? Because of the grace of God has come from outside of this world into your world to literally bring you to life, to literally pay for your debts. Why do you pray? Because, because there's a present God who said he's father. Who do you give thanks to? Uh, Cornelius Plantinga said, it must be an odd feeling to be thankful to nobody in particular. This is the oddity of Thanksgiving Day. Everyone seems to be thankful in general. It's very strange. It's a little bit like being married in general. <laughs> Phil Yancey says, it's a terrible thing to be grateful and have no one to thank, to be awed and have no one to worship. As I was writing this talk, I was thinking, okay, how could I actually practice giving thanks? And then I thought about this candle that sits next to my desk. And my, our staff team hates this candle, so much so that it's a free candle, you know, that the office gives you. And uh, they all say it smells like Vicks Vapor Rub, but I think it smells like heaven. So I love it. And I'm sitting here and I'm like, I'm thankful for this candle, but how would I actually give thanks 
for this candle. Because I can't think of candle, that would just be weird. I don't want to be in my apartment alone thinking of candle. Kind of odd. And so I was like, okay, candles from Des Moines, Iowa. So I would go to Des Moines, Iowa, and I would thank this company who made this candle. But then I couldn't just thank the building of the company who made the candle. I would actually have to go to the person who poured the candle to, make, uh, to thank him. And then I would go to the person who poured the candle, and I would thank him. And then he would be like, well, you shouldn't really thank me. Who you should thank is the CEO. So then I would go all the way to the CEO's office with my Vicks Vapor Rub candle, and I would say, hey, man, thank you so much for this candle. He said, well, you really shouldn't thank me. You should thank my great aunt who really got me into candles. And she lives in Anchorage, Alaska. So I travel all the way to Anchorage, Alaska, and then I thank the great aunt, and I say, thank you for your great cousin, nephew, for getting him into candles. And then she would tell me to thank someone else, and then someone else would tell me to thank someone. And then Thanksgiving would ultimately lead me to a throne. That ev- it's, every good gift comes from the Father above. That's why, that's why Ephesians 5.20 says, who do we give thanks to? Paul says, always give thanks to God. The act of giving thanks is to ultimately come to a conclusion of God. Like, I am thankful for John, and I can give thanks to John for his friendship. But if I wanted to be thankful or give thanks for John, then I thank God, because God made him. Does that make sense? So so I, I can be thankful horizontally, but it ultimately leads me to being thankful vertically. Uh... But why do we give thanks? Like, what reasons do we, if if we're supposed to give thanks to God, what reasons do I have to give thanks to him? How do I give thanks to him? What can I be thankful for? I was preparing, preparing for the Thanksgiving dinner table this Thanksgiving, so I looked up on Google, what should I be thankful for? And Google said, good health, money in the bank, good friends, your parents, having a partner, and pets. I'm not thankful for that. Uh... (laughs) And then I thought, what if there's someone in the world who has none of those six things? What if there's someone in the world who, who can't say any of that? I, like, I don't even have that. Then what? What if they say, good health? Well, how about my diagnosis? What if they say, money in the bank? No, hallelujah, anybody? What if they say, good friends? What if nobody wants to be their friends? Parents? I've been a foster child since I grew up. Having a partner, no one's shown interest in me for a few years. Pets? Nah. (laughs) What, What if someone doesn't have any of these things to be thankful for? I can't bank my thanks on things. And that's what Paul's saying. Always give thanks to God. Because what is reiterated throughout the Old Testament, it's it's 1 Chronicles 16 twice. It's 2 Chronicles twice. It's Ezra. It's Psalm 106, Psalm 107, Psalm 118, Psalm 136, four times. It's Jeremiah 33. Give thanks to the Lord for he's good, for his steadfast love endures forever. So to give thanks is to thank a God who is providently working all things together, both now, then, and in the future. That his goodness and his steadfast love goes all the way back to your past to cleanse you of your sin. And his Goodness and steadfast love is working right now. It's working all things. Everything, everything that's coming at you in life is working even those things together for his good. And then his goodness and steadfast love is preparing history for a day where he will dwell with his people. So why do we give thanks? Because he's good. His steadfast love endures forever. What is the great characteristic of ungodliness? It's ungratitude. What really frustrates God in Exodus and Numbers? It's the people's complaining. It's their grumbling. Paul Paul even says, what's the main feature of pagan depravity? Romans 1.21, he says, for although they knew God, they didn't honor him as God or give thanks to him, but they became futile in their thinking and their foolish hearts were darkened. Billy Graham said, ingratitude is a sin just as surely as is lying or stealing or immorality or any other sin. Nothing turns us into bitter, selfish, dissatisfied people more quickly than an ungrateful heart. And nothing will do more to restore contentment and the joy of our salvation than a true spirit of thankfulness. What restores joy? Gratitude. I give thanks and it restores my joy. You see all these three things working together. I rejoice, I pray, I give thanks. And when I give thanks, I become joyful again. The will of God works together in your life. 
These are the three things that define your life. And so at least, when do we give thanks? It says, give thanks to God in all circumstances. Uh, I notice that he doesn't say for all circumstances. He's not saying to thank God for your root canal. He's saying in every circumstance, give thanks to God. Uh, the power and possibility of giving thanks is in, in every circumstance is rooted in the providence of God. Just because, just because it's nighttime doesn't mean I still can't be thankful for the sun. Or just because I'm cold doesn't mean I can't be thankful for warmth. Just because I'm blinded by an awful, awful circumstance or a situation doesn't mean there's a providential God of care and love behind it that is purposing all things together towards that day for my good and his glory. So we give thanks in all circumstances. Even if you can't tangibly see it, you know there is a father working all things together. Uh, now pause. Some of you are saying, my problem, there's an elephant in the room for some people. My problem is not with these three commands. My problem is with what what, I, what you just said. My problem is not with rejoicing, it's not with praying, it's not with giving thanks. It's with, it's with your power source. It's with this, it's with the generator, it's with God. How, I, how could I rejoice always? How could I pray without saying, how could I give thanks in all circumstances? Like, that means I have to believe in a good and all good and all powerful and all knowing God. And I can't get behind that. If he's good, if his steadfast love endures forever, then I look out in the world and what's going on? There's evil, there's suffering, there's pain. Why hasn't he done anything about it? If there's a God, he can't be loving. He can't care. And I just wanna say, if that's your objection and if that's what you're feeling right now, I want you to know that this church is a safe space for both convinced and unconvinced. Uh, you don't have to clean yourself up. You don't have to hide your doubts to step into the house of God. When, when Thomas doubted, what did Jesus do? He walked to him with his scars. You take your doubts, you take your frustrations with this and you drive it to the throne of God. And so, and so we'll answer that question in a second, but we'll end by talking about how this ends. So what's the will of God for, how does God want you to spend your life? He wants you to be joyful. He wants you to be humble and prayerful, and he wants you to be grateful. More, more than any big decision in life, God's will for your life is that in every moment, if he's working, if he's over it, if he's powerful, then you would spend your whole life rejoicing in the story he's writing. You'd spend your whole life praying to him because he's the one in control. He's the one who has all power. And you'd spend your whole life giving thanks in every circumstance because you know how the story ends. You know where it's going. And people, should, people will begin to look at you and, and when they see you do the will of God, it makes you look different. It makes you look like you're from another world because a grace from another world has come and touched you. And so this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, translations divide on this final part. Uh, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Some translations say what this is, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus, that it says the will of God is in Christ Jesus. Other translations say this is the will of God for you in Christ Jesus. So the difference is this in Christ is either about the will of God or it's about you. Does that make sense? And uh, so, so there's, there's confusion about where the in Christ lands. Is it about the will of God? Is it about what I do? Or is it about you? Is it about who I am? What is it? It's both. You're like, what? No, huh? How? <laughs> because even if it leans one way, the other is affirmed in other places. Even if it leads this way, it's affirmed there. Is what I do in Christ Jesus? Yes. Is who I am in Christ Jesus? Yes. So we see it's both. We see first, uh, it could be that the, this is the will of God for you who is in Christ Jesus. In other words, the foundation of you is in Christ Jesus. Christ Jesus is, is pretty much the reason that you would receive the will of God. And you're saying, well, how do I receive the will of God? Well, you're in Christ Jesus. That's where we began this whole series. 
uh, that the people of God are encompassed into Christ Jesus. And you say, how do I get in there? Do I work my way in? Do I go do a certain amount of community service or pray a certain amount of times or know a certain amount of things? No, you can't do anything actually. There's nothing you can do to enter that circle, nothing. It's so perfect that it can't let in the impurity of you. The only way you can get in is if you see something, is if you see what 2 Corinthians 5 says. It says, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You have to see this. How, How do you become in Christ Jesus? You have to see that he stood in your place. Do you you see what that means? When you say someone stands in your place, it it literally means they stand in where you were supposed to be. In other words, punishment for sin was coming. God God wanted to deal with the evil in the world without wiping out you one day. And so he had to punish sin. And in the moment of great rescue, in the moment of the world's greatest love, Christ Jesus stepped in your place And so you didn't get touched by judgment. Why? Because he bore the iniquity of us all. And so by him stepping in your place means you naturally get to step into his place. And so that means when God sees your sin, he sees it on Christ, he sees it on the cross. When God God sees you, he sees Christ's performance. He sees righteousness, he sees beauty, he sees glory. And he says, that's what I'm gonna dwell with forever. It's not about what you've done. It's, you can't earn it. He just stepped in your place. And you have, to, you have to let that sight seep into your heart. It has to change you. But then you see, it's not just us that's in Christ Jesus. Uh, the will of God could also be in Christ Jesus. The foundation of the will of God is in Christ Jesus. As in whatever you do in life is in him. He, Christ Jesus is the power by which you perform all of these things. Uh, The foundation of everything you do is founded upon him. How does God prove his providence? If God is all powerful and all good, you look out in the world and he say, he's not off the hook. He hasn't done anything. I, I love Peter Kreft, who's a philosopher, said, oh, would you see? Jesus Christ put himself on the hook of human suffering. And so you may... You may not understand the reason why something is happening to you. You may not understand the reason of a storm that's coming in life. You may not know the reason, and God may not give it to you. But you have the resources to face any storm. Why? Because you have the assurity that the king cares for you. That when you needed him most, he went to a cross. That Jesus Christ bore ultimate physical and spiritual pain on the cross for you. And so... The providential God we're talking about isn't isn't some far separated God up there. Rather, he cared so much about the hurt in the world that that he went to a cross to bear your iniquities. So you whatever you say, you can't say, you can't say God doesn't care about you. You can't say God's not for you. He's for you. He's love you. Uh, Brian Chappell, who was once president at Covenant Seminary tells a story about some boys from his neighborhoods and uh, it's, it's a little bit of a tearjerker, but I believe it's appropriate. And he tells the story about two boys from the neighborhood that went out and played one day. And that day they found themselves on a, in a form of sand that was quicksand and they began to sink. And that night they didn't come home. And the whole neighborhood, the family, the police, everyone went out looking for them and couldn't find them. And then the next morning, they came to the scene and one boy was there. And, it, and the, younger, the younger brother had sand to his shoulders and the older brother was nowhere to be seen and he was unconscious and they dug him up to his waist and he, he, he came back and started talk with, talking with them and they said, where's your older brother? And the younger brother said, I'm standing on his shoulders. 
And Brian Chapel says, it was the tangible and sacrificial death and love of the older brother that literally served as a foundation for the younger brother's life. Oh, do you see the picture? What is the foundation by which you can rejoice always? What is the foundation by which you can know God is always there when you pray? What is the foundation by which you can give thanks in all circumstances, even when life said it's worse? It's, it's that your older brother, it's that the son of God, he died so that you stand on his shoulders. And so now everything we do, everything about who we are, everything about how we live, every way we rejoice, every way we pray, every way we give thanks is all standing on his shoulders. It's the message that we stand on is Christ crucified. We're not strong enough to stand on our own performance. What we need is him. He bore the iniquity of us all. He came for you. He stood in your place. That is the sure foundation. That is the only way, that is the only way you can do the will of God. You won't be able to rejoice always. You won't be able to pray without ceasing. You won't be able to give thanks in all circumstances unless you're on a rock. The old hymn goes this, his oath, his covenant, his blood, support me in the whelming flood. When all around my soul gives way, he then is my hope and stay. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. Is he your rock? If he is, you'll rejoice, you'll pray, and you'll give thanks.